light out everybody what's up everybody welcome back to another episode of the lights out podcast i'm your host josh joined in the studio with me is my co-host austin what is up man hey how's it going today we are diving into the wild west the wild west is a very interesting time period in my perspective i really enjoy learning about the history and just all the crazy shit that went down yeah in the wild west and all the outlaws the gunslingers i mean just the average lifespan for people during the the 1800s was between 35 and 46 years old we'd be coming up on i was gonna say i know like just the amount of crimes and activity that these outlaws got done in such a short amount of time is truly mind-blowing i mean we're gonna today we're gonna be looking at probably one of the most i mean really he's a serial killer this was before the term serial killer was even a thing but john wesley harden i think has one of the highest body counts when it comes to the number of people he killed in all of old west history which is pretty crazy to think about and just his life story is absolutely insane i mean it honestly sounds like fiction when you read about it and and there is a chance that some of it is fiction right a little little tweaked yeah Yeah. a lot of it comes from his own book so it's like right right you know know, and are they going to tell the truth in that or are they going to kind of stretch the truth a little bit to make themselves you know sort of go down as a legend you know what i mean and to be fair a lot of people did that back then like wild right. bill a lot of it was fictionalized a little bit you know right so we've tried to research his life and pull as much of the facts that we can as well as some of it may be stretching the truth a bit but his life story is absolutely insane i mean it honestly it reminds me of you know my character from red dead redemption in a way yeah. <laughs> like um just going out there and shooting someone yeah, just, dead just yeah. the amount of, of, of things that he did and people he killed and crimes he committed is is absolutely insane but with that being said before we dive into the episode there's a couple things i wanted to mention first of all we have some new merch designs that are launching the day of this episode going live which is january 27th i've been working on these designs for a few months now i'm actually wearing one of the items which is a new zip hoodie lights out podcast zip hoodie it's got a skull on the back he's wearing a candle it's got uh, kind of lightning around him and a moon it's it's really really cool i also have a cauldron lights out design as well as a ouija board design on a long sleeve all really bright colors good quality so if you are looking for some lights out merch that is now available at milehighmerch.com go check it out um, we're already starting to work on the next collection and this collection is very limited so We're not doing restocks anymore. If you want one of the items, go and get it now because as soon as they sell out, we are not reordering them. So this is it. Also, this episode is brought to you by Daily Harvest. More on them later. But let's just go ahead and dive into the Old West. You know, this is one thing I I don't think is necessarily an interest to everybody. But when you hear some of these outlaw stories, I think it will pique anybody's interest because just... The sheer amount amount of things that they do is is absolutely insane. I mean, you got to remember too this the time period. You have to kind of like stop for a moment and really think about what it was like to live during the 1800s and you know the 1900s. I mean, we're talking about a time before modern medications. There's no penicillin, aspirin, and so these guys were just out there, you know, having shootouts taking bullets, hoping that they don't die from the bullets because these bullets contained lead. Yeah. So a lot of times they died from you know if they didn't die from the actual gunshot itself they died from the lead poisoning of the bullet just yeah you got shot in the leg and you'll die a few days later yeah right or infections and things like that because again there was no antibiotics or anything like that so it's just an absolutely brutal time to be alive and really if you were outside a lot of the major towns or cities you're really on your own i mean there was still laws and rules and things like that to govern those areas but a lot of the times you know, a gang decide to roll through or a bunch of bandits decide to roll through and take everything you have. I mean, what are you going to do about it? It was up to you to to defend yourself. Otherwise you're losing everything. And I just can't imagine what that must've been like, you know, imagine walking out your, your front door, you know, having to really like look over your shoulder and just 
be ready for anything to pop off at any time. And obviously oh, I do that today. Yeah, I know. Seriously. I mean, it's <laughs> sometimes it feels like it's still the wild west out there just with how much craziness is going on in our world today. But I mean, obviously now we have all these services and, you know, there's police that show up at your, your door and, you know, minutes versus back then. I mean, you could be an hour away from the nearest sheriff and yeah. I mean, even They're just not getting the fact in that time. we we could just we got our phones in our pockets, we can right, call the police right. immediately. I was reading some book, and um, the War of eighteen twelve broke out. This is a little side note: the fastest they could get from D.C. to the other end of the U.S. It took them a month to to get to that the war even started. That's crazy, and no one even knew. Yeah, They're that's like, what's so crazy. Just like, I mean, obviously the spread of information had changed everything, and the internet changed everything. But before all that, it was yeah horseback like somebody had to like ride and you know there's the pony express and all that of like yeah. you know you had to mail a letter or a telegram or something like that yeah. telegrams came later but word would not even get to you know where you wanted it to go for days or months at a yeah. time so it's like your cousin died of cholera <laughs> right four right. months ago right. yeah. yeah it's just it's just a wild period to think of and, and hollywood is obviously really sensationalized a lot of this and there's a lot of misconceptions about the wild west because of the movies at Hollywood and shows that Hollywood have, has created over the years. And so we're going to kind of dispel some of those myths because I think when you actually look at the real reality of what was going on at the time, I, I think it's way different than I think what a lot of us think happened during that time, you know, because a lot of us get, you know, unless you study the old West in, in great detail, read books, documentaries, things like that. I think most of us have gotten our knowledge from, I know for me, a lot of it came from, the game red dead redemption i mean there's a lot of very sure. realistic things within yeah. that video game which is cool and just being able to immerse yourself in that world and you know kind of experience what life yeah, was like just tie that. someone up and throw them on <laughs> a train track right exactly yeah. exactly or just you know rob a train or you know go into town and you know all of a sudden you're a wanted man and you've yeah. got the you know you've got the, the army and all of the sheriffs after you and stuff and and there's a bounty on your head and things like that yeah. i really love that game because it really does give you a very authentic experience of of what it was like to to live in that time period and just kind of what everything looked like and you know it's i think it's pretty historically accurate when it comes to how it depicts the old west but if you don't go deep into it a lot of it comes from hollywood and there's just so much that was created by hollywood to give you this perception of what it was really like you know uh, the shootout at the okay corral well it turns out there wasn't necessarily a shootout at the okay corral and just the way that you know, these movies and, you know, how they depicted outlaws is just so different from the actual reality of things. So that's why I'm excited to get into this episode because there's a lot of brutal aspects to John Wesley Harden's life and obviously a lot of murder within it. So it's definitely a dark one, but um, there's definitely some interesting tidbits along the way. So with that being said, let's dive into the life of one of the deadliest outlaws of the Wild West, and that is John Wesley Hardin. So like Austin alluded to at the beginning, a lot of the stories we're gonna talk about, a lot of the information in fact comes from John Wesley Hardin's own autobiography, which was published in 1896. So again, we're not exactly sure how much of his life story is fact and how much of it is fiction, but these stories capture the absolute dangerous life that people lived out there on the cow trail and how common murder was for outlaws and gunslingers, and how easy it was for them to avoid justice. So John Wesley Hardin was born on May 26, 1853 in Bonham, Texas. He was the son of a Methodist preacher named James Gipp Hardin and his wife, Mary Elizabeth Dixon. And he was actually named after the founder of the Methodist faith, John Wesley, which is very ironic when we get to the end of his life there looking back. But his father always wanted John to become a preacher, but his life would lead him down a very different path. When John was young, his family traveled across Texas because his father was a circuit driver, which this was a traveling clergyman who visited new settlements, preached the word of God, and organized new congregations. Locals often used the local schoolhouse as their gathering place. After traveling, the Harden family eventually settled down in Sumter, Trinity County in 1859 and James found work as a school teacher. He also set up a learning institution that John and his nine other siblings attended. 
John's father was living a very happy life up until the Civil War broke out a few years later in 1861. James wanted to leave his job and join the Confederate Army, but he was convinced to stay behind as he would be more useful as a teacher and a clergyman in Sumter. Much like his father, John also wanted to go out and fight against the Union, but he was only nine years old at the time. As it turned out, John was a direct descendant of a Revolutionary War hero, Colonel Joseph Hardin, who later became a legislator for North Carolina. So John held a ton of pride for his nation, especially during wartime. John and his brother Joe Gibson Hardin, who was three years older, devised a plan to run away from home and join the war anyway. But before they could do that, their father overheard their plan. And as a result, he beat his sons until they promised that they wouldn't run off and join the Confederacy. James desperately wanted John to follow in his footsteps, but John distanced himself from religion. While the war waged on, John was shaped by local politics. He supported the Confederacy and believed slavery was a necessity, especially because his father owned several slaves. Meanwhile, his hatred towards black people only grew, and this hatred fueled his violence. As he grew into his teens in 1867, he was bullied by a boy named Charles Slaughter. Charles accused John of drawing graffiti that insulted a schoolmate on the schoolhouse wall. John denied it and then accused Charles of writing it. Before you knew it, things got heated and they both pulled out pocket knives, and John ended up stabbing the other boy twice and almost killed him. When school officials stopped the fight, John was faced with being expelled, but he said he was only defending himself, which, as we'll find out later on, he loved using the excuse of self-defense. John was able to convince the school officials though, so he never got into any trouble, and this was John's first taste of bloodshed, as far as we know. And after this, he only wanted more. Only a year later, when John was 15, he committed his first murder. In his autobiography, he always tried to portray himself as a victim or a hero, of course, and he always justified his violence in some way. He later said that the people that I killed needed killing. I don't know about you, but that statement right there tells you a lot about John's way of thinking and his philosophy. His first victim was his uncle's former slave named Mage. The Civil War had just ended and millions of slaves in the South had been freed, but like many people, John looked down on the recently freed former slaves. In his eyes, he would never see them as equals. Until one day, John and his cousin taunted Mage until they got into a wrestling match. The two boys beat him in the match and John even drew some of his blood. After the match, Mage challenged John to a shooting duel. John wasn't known for turning down a chance at violence, so he ran home to get his gun. And when he got there, his uncle had heard about what had happened and stopped John before he could leave the house. The next day, John was riding his horse around town when he came across Mage again. Mage spotted John on horseback and according to John, he charged into the street. He then grabbed John's horse by the bridle and then pulled John. And then at that point, John pulled out his Colt 44 and shot Mage five times. After Mage had been shot five times, obviously he was in critical condition. And apparently John rode to go get some help, but it was too late. Mage died three days later. And since Mage was a free man, this meant that this was murder in the eyes of the law. So this was basically kind of the first time that John became a wanted man and he was forced to flee town. Of course, John never thought he had done anything wrong. He always claimed self-defense. And in his autobiography, he claimed that Mage had attacked him. And if he didn't kill the former slave, no one would be brought to justice. Over the years, he grew distrustful of the justice system, especially now that the Union had won the war. And he believed that the courts were filled with Yankee bureaucrats and enemies of the South. By now, the Civil War had ended years ago, but it was still fresh on many American minds. Many Confederates still hung on to their old ways or still considered themselves Confederates. And John had as much hatred for the Union as he did for people of color. And this caused his violence only to escalate. After a warrant was issued for John's arrest, he fled into the countryside. Eventually, local authorities got a tip about where he was hiding, so they sent three Union soldiers to go and arrest him. John's older brother Joe warned him about their arrival. So John was able to basically set up an ambush, and he ended up killing all the Union soldiers. In his own words, he said, I waylaid them, as I had no mercy on men whom I knew only wanted to get my body to torture and kill. 
It was war to the knife for me, and I brought it on by opening the fight with a double-barreled shotgun and ended it with a cap and ball six-shooter. Thus, it was by the fall of 1868 I had killed four men and was myself wounded in the arm. After he killed the Union soldiers, he stole their guns and supplies and buried them in a nearby creek. Mind you, he was only 15 years old at the time, but already very deep into a life of crime and murder, and he knew that he couldn't return home at this point. So he headed to Navarro County, Texas to connect with other outlaws. While he was there, he met a man named Frank Polk, who had recently killed a man named Tom Brady. As John and Frank tried to stay hidden from authorities, a few more Union soldiers tried to hunt them down. Frank was later caught, but John, well, he escaped. While trying to lay low in Pisgah, Texas, John got a teaching job for a short time. But just because he was a teacher doesn't mean that this stopped him from getting into trouble. In his book, he claimed that while in town, he won a bottle of whiskey after shooting a man's eye out. And I think that was literal. He then met up with his cousin named Simp Dixon. Simp was a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Of course, John had no problem riding with the white supremacist for a while. They also got into a shootout with more Union soldiers in 1869, and they ended up killing two more of them. Simp ended up being captured not long after, and they executed him by firing squad. John survived and later decided to roam around Texas for a while by himself. So this was around the time when uh, he actually popularized the way of carrying his guns, which is kind of funny. Instead of having his re revolvers at the hip, which is like what most people have, yeah. uh, he put them up in shoulder holsters, which are higher up on the chest. But what he did was he, he did a cross draw, which was common if it was on your hip, there was, you know, you could just, you just reached across your body to pull it out. But instead he cross drawed two revolvers across his <laughs> chest, which yeah. is kind of silly. Like under the arms, like, yeah. <laughs> Which to me doesn't seem like a very efficient way to, to draw your weapon. I mean, if you're trying to draw it fast, it seems like a lot of work. Which yeah. I, I think the benefits that would be, you could kind of like act like you're reaching, you know, just kind of have your hands in your, under your coat or vest or whatever he was wearing. And then you'd have quick access to it that way right. versus, you know. I could see one maybe. Right, but right. yeah, no, he's going a Kimbo style two pulling yeah. out of his chest which just seems kind of crazy right but, rather than focusing on like aiming one pistol yeah. i'm gonna shoot two at the same time yeah. i wonder how accurate he was do you know if he if the holsters were visible under his arms or if they were like if he had them more concealed like under a coat or I jacket think it was common that he was wearing a coat i know the straps were above like his vest so you could still see the, that the he holster. had holsters yeah. yeah there'd be like leather straps going across exactly yeah. but i think they were hidden by an overcoat yeah. interesting i don't know that to me that seems like he just wants to make himself unique or you know yeah it's just to be flashy just to be flashy like yeah. oh yeah i carry two and i'm ready to go <laughs> yeah. so on january 5th 1870 john found himself out in toash hill county texas he played a game of cards with a man named benjamin bradley John apparently won almost every hand, and after each win, Benjamin just got more and more angry. He said that if John won one more hand, he would cut out his liver. Benjamin then flaunted his six-shooter and a hunting knife across the poker table. John wasn't armed at the time, so he took his winnings and excused himself from the table. But later that night, John heard someone call his name from across Toash Street. It was none other than Benjamin Bradley. In the dark, a flash and a bang rang out across the dark street, but the shot missed John. And again, in self-defense, John drew two revolvers and returned fire. According to John, one bullet hit Benjamin in the chest and the other in the head. And not even a month later, John ran into more trouble. On January 20th, 1870, John traveled to Horn Hill, Limestone County, Texas, and there he got into an argument at the local circus. This is really interesting. This is kind of a total random side note, but... In the early 1800s, there were feral camels roaming around Texas. What? And that there's actually, I don't know if John necessarily rode a camel, but there's a number of outlaws, like famous outlaws, that actually rode camels. That's sweet. As opposed to horses. Yeah, apparently, I think the, the army ordered camels from Egypt, like $30,000 worth of camels, had it like exported from Egypt to Texas. I and guess. apparently some of them got out and then just started reproducing. 
And so it was like a fear of settlers and things like that at the time to run into a bunch of camels because camels just especially feral camels are not, you know, they're not they're not friendly. Yeah, they're, they're crazy. They're yeah. crazy. Yeah. So there, there's these dangerous camels roaming around Texas. That but, makes sense though, because I know camels can survive because uh, you know they store their water. And right, they can right. Longer. It's so kind of a similar for, landscape for them. Yeah, for like out west or in the desert or yeah. something. That would be terrifying. Coming I thought that was so that. weird. I was like, I've never heard of that before. That there's feral camels roaming around Texas. Do you, do you know what ended up happening to them? I think most of them either died or I don't know. I'm, I'm curious if anybody out there knows who lives in Texas if there's still feral camels out there. And if not, let's bring them back. Yeah, I know. God, that's so interesting. I mean, it, I'm sure it wasn't enough to sustain like beyond the 1800s, you know, Yeah, because it was $30,000 worth. So I don't know exactly how many they they actually purchased, but it was enough that they reproduced. But they either were, you know, killed just like the bison were killed for right. meat or resources or whatever, or um, eventually they, they removed them or something like that. But I'm curious if there is still feral camels on I feel like I would we would hear about that yeah. if there was like yeah. oh yeah there's this part in Texas where these wild camels are roaming around yeah. so so yeah I'm pretty sure that they're not it's not a thing anymore but during the 1800s it was that's just awesome. a just an interesting interesting thing so it's possible that even John Wesley Harden was trotting around, around on camel. a camel Hell yeah hopefully <laughs> that's such an interesting that's a funny sight to think and the other thing too is like in hollywood you know there's the classic like cowboy hat you know kind of curved and things like that that came along in fashion later on in texas um but it before that they wore like bowler hats bowler hat. yeah. yeah like if you look at cowboys from back then they nobody's wearing like a traditional cowboy it's, hat i blame hollywood a little bit for yeah. all these misconceptions about right. the old west but yeah the, the, another one i i was reading about um the fear of always constantly being threatened by indigenous Right, Americans, right. Hollywood made it seem like you pack up a wagon and try to cross town, and you just be ransacked and scalped, and yeah, you'd yeah. die. But really, most of the time, they were just used. Uh, they were really good for information. Uh, yeah, they were, they were friendly, and there was a lot of trading going yeah, on, and food and and pelts and furs and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, it was more it's quite rare. the opposite. I yeah, feel like if yeah. anything, you're probably going to get shot by a bandit, right? Or John Wesley Harden, when right you're out there. But, well, a lot of these gangs would like have little enclaves outside of these towns and things like that where they would, you know, there'd be a big group of them. And yep. and if you just happen to cross their path at the wrong time, then they take advantage of that. And, you know, oftentimes would kill your whole family, take everything you have and just leave you there. Yeah. Yeah. At the start of every year, I always have the best intentions, especially for myself and my health. And one of the things I'm really trying to do this year is eliminate the processed foods, eat healthy and fresh foods only. And thankfully, Daily Harvest is there to help me really achieve this goal this year. If you don't know about Daily Harvest, they deliver delicious harvest bowls, soups, flatbreads, snacks, smoothies, lattes, and more built on organic fruits and vegetables. Daily Harvest works directly with farmers to source the best ingredients, and they freeze it at peak ripeness to lock in flavor and nutrients, and they never use artificial preservatives or ingredients. With nourishing and easy to prep options and never have to think twice about what I'm going to eat for my next meal, whether it's a snack or even a dessert. I absolutely love the smoothies. They're a bunch of different combinations. There's like a blueberry and banana one I've been enjoying lately. Daily Harvest is also committed to human and planetary health, which means they do their best to ensure transparency and integrity when it comes to their ingredients and the humans who grow them. By supporting farmers who invest in practices that increase biodiversity and improve the health of our soil, and by delivering food in recyclable and compostable packaging where possible, Daily Harvest does the work I eat and enjoy. It's a win-win. So if eating well is a goal for 2023, let Daily Harvest support you on your journey. Go to dailyharvest.com slash lights out to get up to $40 off your first box. That's dailyharvest.com slash lights out for up to $40 off your first box. Check them out today at dailyharvest.com slash lights out. So John had gotten into an argument at, at the local circus that he was at. And apparently this argument escalated into a gunfight like it usually did with John. But luckily no one was killed. A week later in the town of Koss, John escorted a prostitute home late at night. And according to John, a man came out of the shadows, drew a revolver, and demanded money. Supposedly this was the woman's pimp. Acting quickly, John threw a lump of cash on the ground as a distraction. And when the mugger bent down to pick it up, John drew his revolvers from his vest and shot the man in the back of the skull. 
it's almost like he was just itching for you know oh, a reason to shoot somebody. He's looking for trouble. He's just absolutely looking for trouble. The fun fun fact about prostitutes back then, which I didn't realize. Um, again, Hollywood usually portrays them kind of on the lower end of the social ladder, but really these were the few women who could go out by themselves, dance, carry firearms. These were actually women with the most rights compared to the domestic women where just you kept them at home. They would not be allowed to, they can't go to the store, especially not by themselves, but supposedly prostitutes had the most rights out of any women in the old West. That's interesting. I wonder if it's like a, you know, because the, of the work that they did, it was like it gained respect with the men. You yeah. Know? And, and obviously they were hanging around the saloons and places right. like that and participating in card game. You know, they were kind of like immersed in the men's world at the time. Because right. obviously there was like major gender roles back then. Like if you Huge, weren't, yeah. if you weren't a prostitute or, or, you know, some other occupation, you were the homemaker, right? You were at home cooking, cleaning for the kids or, yep. and things like that. But, that, that makes a lot of sense, honestly. And yeah. obviously they're probably making pretty good money, but I do wonder how, how much exploitation there was like, Oh, probably way of, too much of like, yeah. you know, pimps out there that had multiple women and, and you know, they were getting a cut of whatever they made. Oh, yeah. and I don't like want that. to make it sound like they were like treated equally. Right. Yeah, yeah. No. Yeah, and I'm sure there was tons of abuse and all kinds of crazy shit that yeah. happened with, you know, sex workers back then. So yeah. yeah, but that's, that's pretty interesting. So by January of the next year, John was finally arrested, but not for any of the previous murders listed. He was arrested for the murder of Waco, Texas City Marshal Laban John Hoffman. The city marshal had been sitting in a local barber shop waiting for a shave. His face was actually lathered up in shaving cream when a stranger just burst through the barber shop door, walked up to the marshal's chair, and shot him in the back of the head, killing him instantly. This suspect then fled the scene and was last seen leaving town on horseback. Many suspected that the killer was John Harden, but he denied any involvement. Reports later claimed he was an accomplice to the real killer, who might have been an outlaw named Wild George Thomason. But George had been shot to death during a shootout with state police. Wild George might have been the actual shooter, but John ended up taking the fall for the murder of the marshal. He wasn't able to persuade the judge of his innocence, so they held him in a temporary jail made of logs in the town of Marshall and the lawmen planned on transferring him to Waco for the trial. But John had other plans. He was able to smuggle in a small revolver from another prisoner while waiting to be transferred. He then hid the pistol by tying it to his underarm with a string beneath his shirt. So on the day they moved him, two state policemen, Captain Edward T. Stakes and Officer Jim Smalley, were assigned to escort John to Waco. They dragged John from his cell and took a length of rope and tied John to a horse with no saddle. And after a long day's journey through the Texan countryside, the policemen stopped to set up camp for the night. Captain Stakes went to get some horse fodder, so John was left alone with Officer Smalley. The officer took the ropes off of John, lifted him off the horse, and threw him to the ground. Then he took out his revolver and flipped it around, so he held the barrel in his hand with the wooden butt end of the grip facing towards John. While John still was shackled, Smalley began beating John with the butt of his revolver. After several blows, John began crying and moaning, and tried to run and hide behind the horse as Smalley chased him around. As Smalley rounded the back side of the horse though, John was able to draw that hidden revolver and he fatally shot the officer several times. He then mounted the horse and fled to the next closest town where he found a blacksmith to remove his metal shackles. After becoming a free outlaw again, he met up with his cousins named Clements in Gonzales County, South Texas. His cousins told him he could make a decent living by getting into the cattle market. The cattle business was rapidly growing in Kansas, so this was a good way to leave Texas behind long enough for the police to lose his trail. I mean, imagine those days. You could just be like, yeah, if I get far enough away from town, you know, the police will stop looking for me. Right. Yep. You know, I'll just become a, a wanted poster. It's and, like, oh, he's 40 miles out. Let's just forget about right. it. Right. Which yeah. I love that about Red Dead Redemption, that you can like outrun law enforcement. <laughs> yeah. Like in GTA, I'm like, it's so unrealistic that you can you know, shake the police and all your stars drop and then you just go back to rolling around. There's not really like a wanted aspect to you. And, you know, when you have no stars on you in GTA, you're you're good to go. Right. It's like nothing ever happened. You could have just committed a massacre, (laughs) jumped in a plane or helicopter, flew to the top of a mountain, lose all the stars and you're good to go. Clean slate. Clean slate. So, yeah, I love that. I love the aspect of Red Dead Redemption, the, the bounty system. 
So this is when John became a true cowboy and he began rustling cattle for Jake Johnson and Columbus Carroll. He was even promoted to trail boss for the entire herd. Yeah, I didn't know this. Uh, after the end of the Civil War, the Union didn't have too much cattle and they had used it all up. That's how they fed a lot of soldiers, apparently. And that's also when kind of the North and the country in general got a big taste for, for cow meat. So the Union realized, wow, we don't have a lot of ranching here. It all comes from the South. Right. So that's when cattle ranching from they're going from texas to kansas uh, like that was kind of farther trail. up north yeah, yeah versus down in the deep south because yeah. they wanted more of it um huh so yeah about a dozen cowboys could move three thousand cattle in a single drive and one cattle could be sold for forty dollars whatever the math is on that it's which, it is a lot which of yeah money. i mean that would be you know quite a bit more money now if it was a dozen cowboys could move about 3,000 cattle in a single drive. One cattle could be sold for $40. So it'd be 1,500 for in today's money for that cattle. Yeah. That would be equivalent in, in today's money though, for the whole drive that would be in the million. So 1,500 times say 3,000 head, four and a half million dollars. Yep. That's insane. To put that into perspective, most cowboys made 25 to $40 a month which is equivalent to like a few hundred dollars. So really they weren't getting paid that much. No. It was really whoever was running the show. Right there you can see the incentive for cattle rustling, right? Like stealing cattle from others. And I mean, yeah, that's a lot of money. A that lot. Yep. It's pro probably almost as good as like robbing the bank. Yes. It's probably easier too yeah, than yeah, robbing seriously. the bank. So. Ran into a lot of trouble with that, um, with stealing cattle, even from their own men. They would, some guys would just be like, can I round up five oh, and, wow. and just take just off with of them here, and yeah. sell them and go on the run. Yep. Um, and besides that, besides just getting the cattle drives going, uh, they had other work to do. They worked like 15 hour days, which is crazy. They fixed fences, cared for the horses, did the cattle drives. Some even, especially when they were going out West, they set up frontier towns. And yeah, so it's crazy that John got hired at a pretty young age and they gave him the position of trail boss, which is like top dog. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I wonder what connections he had. They, I tried to look into it and how they just promoted him to like, okay, you're running the show. So that's, or maybe this is a tall tale from John. Yeah, you know what I mean? Because like, yep. if you think about how this whole story is going, John's always at the top. Always. John's, you know, like there's not a lot of like setbacks for John that seem real, right? And right. so I almost wonder if this is like, you know, he did go, he actually was, you know, a cowboy for a bit, but of course he wouldn't want to admit in his book of his legendary life that he was the bottom of the totem yeah, pole. They were making him clean up <laughs> right. the spittoons and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Instead, he's of course a trail boss at this young age. And yeah. I mean, unless, unless there was kind of word that went around about him and that he was kind of this don't mess with me type of individual, like you don't want to piss him off, right? Right. And so maybe that was the case where you know he started working and they were like ah oh, we don't want to piss this guy off he might murder us all so let's <laughs> yeah, make him the trail go, boss yeah. so he was also known as a pretty smart guy as well so he's i it seems like he's, he's pretty competent. witty and clever and yeah. i mean he was taught school and stuff so he obviously had exactly he obviously had some education and it just kind of seemed like he was kind of a few steps ahead of everybody you yeah. know so yeah so as trail boss he uh you know top dog position um and they often rode with the most experienced cowboy which usually was maybe an older one and they were known as a segundo interesting yeah that sounds like a spanish word vast majority of cowboys back then were people of color it was i think i read a statistic it was like 25 percent were black even more than that were mexicans and it actually the cowboys originated uh, yeah as that whole culture originates yeah. from mexico because yeah. a lot of, again hollywood was like white right of course that we yeah had, right but no it was really a lot of mexicans were uh then they were called uh vaqueros right yeah. right yeah that's really interesting yep. so as a trail boss john was pretty strict and aggressive with the other men especially the ones who weren't white in february of 1871 they started forming the herd up for a drive to kansas a freed man named Bob King tried to cut one of the beef cows out of the herd. John demanded him to stop. The man refused to listen to John, so he rode up to him and pistol whipped him over the head, knocking him out. Later that same month, John got into a fight with three of the Mexican cowboys over a card game called 
three card Monty. John ended up injuring each of them. And this was just the beginning of John's violence during his time as a cowboy. And it was people like John that gave cattle rustlers a bad reputation. While on the Chisholm Trail to Abilene, Kansas, John constantly got into fights, especially with the Mexican cowboys, like Austin just said, were known as vaqueros. Toward the end of their drive, a Mexican herd had crowded behind John's cattle drive. Soon the two herds got mixed together and John went out to find the trail boss of this other herd. After exchanging some heated words, the Mexican trail boss of the other herd unholstered his gun and shot at John. The bullet ended up going right through his hat, but missed his head by inches. John pulled out his old Civil War era cap and ball pistol and aimed it, but the gun misfired. So he quickly hopped off of his horse and charged at the other trail boss. Meanwhile, he steadied the cylinder of his gun with one hand and pulled the trigger with the other. So imagine that move. That's a pretty, that's a pretty advanced move there. Like, <laughs> yeah. Again, a, probably a tall tale. I Yo, mean, that doesn't yeah. seem very efficient to roll around with a Civil War pistol. Right. I think it's like image, right? It's like pretty, uh, that scene, if you think about it, it's a pretty badass scene to be like, oh, I got this Civil War era pistol and I'm firing it with two hands. Yeah, and yeah. And it's a single charging shot. Him on, yeah, so it's right. like if you miss, you're screwed. So he has to make the shot. Right, and, and, right. Um, so apparently the bullet that he shot was lodged into the man's thigh and nearly shattered his femur. Before the fight could escalate anymore, though, a truce was called, and each of the cattle drives split up. But for John, it wasn't over. He felt wronged, and he wanted revenge. That night, John borrowed a new revolver from one of his friends and headed out to find this other Mexican trail boss. A few of the other cowboys followed along. It didn't take long to find the other camp, and that's when John snuck up to the trail boss and shot him point blank in the head. It seemed like that was that was his favorite move of like point blank shots, like execution style, basically. Yep. Which is like, how the hell did he sneak? I'm sure that this other trail boss wasn't alone. So how did he like stealthy like sneak yeah, up? Yeah, right. And, Metal Gear Solid. Yeah, all the way seriously. There, it's yeah. like what? And it's so funny to me that he wanted revenge after he shot the guy. <laughs> right. The guy has a shattered <laughs> femur. He's already yeah. like probably can't ride anymore. I mean, and he might die from that exactly. lead ball you just put into his yeah, head. Yeah, so he's just out for blood. He wants to kill someone. Yeah, you know? I mean, he, he's, he's a legit serial killer. He's, he's yep. thirsty for blood. As the gunshot rang out, though, a firefight started between the two camps again. Six of the Vaqueros were killed during the shootout, and John claimed that he had killed five of them himself. After this massacre, he also claimed that he killed two indigenous Americans in self-defense during the rest of the cattle drive. Soon after, on July 20th, 1871, he claimed that he had joined a lynch mob to hunt down and kill an unnamed vaquero after the man had been accused of killing a fellow trail boss. After the bloodshed along the trail, John and his crew finally made it to Abilene, Kansas. John might have killed around eight people just on that cattle drive up to Kansas. And mind you, John Hardin was only 18 years old at the time, which Honestly, that is so hard to believe that at 18 years old. I mean, you're barely a man at that point, right? I mean, you're barely Your brains barely developed. Yeah, you're not at your full physical stature most likely and this dude just rolling around Murdering people left and right. Yeah, and somehow not sustaining any serious injuries along the way Which yeah. is honestly mind-blowing to me that yeah. he's not shot multiple times through all these shootouts, right? I mean when I was 18 I was Rolling out of bed at like 1 p.m. <laughs> yeah. to play some video games. This guy's just out murdering people. I know. Doing it all. Yeah. So after they reached Abilene, John decided to stay there for a while and just blow off some steam. While he was there, he made a new acquaintance named Ben Thompson. Ben was a well-known gambler around town, and he had opened up a bar of his own named Bull's Head Tavern. This bar was hard to miss, mostly because they had painted a picture of a bull with a huge erect penis on the side of the building. And this was their way of advertising the tavern. Unsurprisingly, this pissed off the locals and they complained to the town marshal, who was the famous Wild Bill Hickok. So for those who don't know Wild Bill, he was an old folk hero, the American Old West. Oh yeah. And, uh, he's been mentioned a million different times through movies and books and, and anything you could think of. If you can name a profession from the Old West, he probably did it. Like John Harden, though, some of his stories were, they think, were fictionalized or, you know. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. But they added a little fiction spice on everything that he did. But, yeah, he's he's done everything. 
from wrestling bears. He spied for the union. He was an expert sniper, killed several men during gunslinger duels. He later became an actor and a famous gambler. Um, but that all came to an end. He was later shot to death after a gambling dispute out in Deadwood, Dakota in 1876. But really, he became one of the most famous names in the Old West. For a short time, he was the town marshal here where he supposedly ran into to John Harden. Yeah, Interesting. So while he was trying to lay low, John went by the name Wesley Clements, or the nickname Little Arkansas. This was all while he was living in Kansas. And Wild Bill had no idea who he really was. Supposedly, John Harden eventually ran into Wild Bill when he found out about the big bull penis painting on the side of the tavern. Wild Bill demanded that the owners remove the painting, but they refused. So Wild Bill ended up hiring a few painters to sneak over to the tavern at night and paint over the offensive image. The owner, Ben Thompson, then reached out to John for some help. Ben was sick of Wild Bill, always interfering with their business, plus they knew he was a former Union soldier. Ben, who was a former Confederate soldier, thought that, you know, maybe I can convince John to get rid of Wild Bill for me. When Ben confronted John about Wild Bill, he tried to turn John against the marshal, especially since they knew John was an avid supporter of the Confederacy. Ben told him that Wild Bill was a Yankee who picked on rebels, especially Texans, and he was even known for killing them. But John wasn't buying it. He respected Wild Bill, and he knew Bill was a skilled gunslinger. I think that might be the real reason might be risky to try to take out somebody with more skill than you. Yep. So he told Ben that, you know, if you want to get rid of the marshal, then you got to go kill Wild Bill yourself. Clearly, Ben knew that he couldn't face the marshal, so the problem was put to rest for now. A while later, John was out one evening bowling in a local saloon. He and a few of his Texan friends were getting drunk and making a scene. And this was when Wild Bill was called to the saloon. When he arrived, he saw John drunk and making a public disturbance. He told him to pipe it down, but then he noticed that John was armed. So he confronted John and asked him to come outside with him, and the two men left the saloon peacefully. While outside, Wild Bill demanded that John hand over all of his weapons as they weren't allowed in the city limits. Which that's another interesting thing is like, within a lot of these little towns and cities, gun control was a real thing. Yeah, it was huge. The marshals would be like, no guns in my town. Yeah, You would, you would have to go to the, you know, the sheriff's office hand over your weapons and check them in yeah like you get like a little token like a coat check yeah and so until you left town you couldn't get your weapons back yeah that's another misconception where yeah. people like yeah you watch the movies and they're everybody's armed like, yeah yeah and people are like shooting under the tables <laughs> and stuff like you know a card <laughs> poker game goes wrong like i fold <laughs> you know bullets are flying yeah and like it they make it seem like everyone's like challenging everyone to duels and right shit. right and but there's yeah, just no. guns everywhere in yeah. these towns but actually it was pretty safe the exact opposite yeah no guns yeah it was it wasn't until you left town where you would go pick up your guns that's why most of the the murders happened outside, outside of, town. of town because yeah. it, people realize outlaws realize yeah this would be stupid shooting someone in town this is the this is the worst place to do this because it's the most likely i'd get caught right know? right it's gonna be very difficult to pull that off and then get out of town before you're captured by right. by the sheriff and his deputies so right. When Wild Bill demanded that John hand over his weapons, John was pretty reluctant at first, but then he saw Wild Bill draw his pistol. And of course, in John's telling of the story, he began handing over his weapons to Wild Bill. He held his revolvers out with the butt ends toward Bill, which when they did this, this was meant to be a non-aggressive way to safely hand over your weapons. But as Wild Bill went to grab them, John performed what's known as a road agent spin or a curly bill spin. Basically, he flipped the revolvers in his hands so that they were both aimed at Wild Bill's head. According to John, half the city's population had actually surrounded them, and they all cheered him on. Really? Right. Bullshit. Yeah, dude. Seriously. Like, yeah, get Wild Bill. <laughs> yeah. Meanwhile, like, Wild what? Bill's been, like, keeping the town safe and Yeah, well, orderly. And what, everyone wants the marshal dead. Yeah, the one right. that's protecting you. Come on. Apparently, they were chanting, shoot Wild Bill dead. <laughs> so... According to John, it would be an execution by public demand. But John had mercy on Wild Bill. After the incident, they went into the saloon and had a drink together. Of course. <laughs> In another version of the story, John simply just handed over the weapons and that was it. Which is likely the true version. Luckily for John, Wild Bill still had no idea that John was a wanted man in Texas. A few months later, John met Wild Bill again while out on a cattle drive in August 1871. This time, Wild Bill trusted John with firearms when they got back into Abilene, 
which was rare for any traveler that came through Wild Bill's town. So John felt like he and Wild Bill were slowly becoming friends. They would drink together and then go out on a few more cattle drives. Even though their ideologies were completely different, they respected each other as cattle rustlers and gunslingers, at least according to John. For a few more weeks, John and Wild Bill drank and picked up women at the local saloons. Wild Bill began to think John was a decent man, but his opinion would soon change, as John wasn't known for basic decency. After playing his role as a young Texan outlaw, cattle rustler, and a friend of Wild Bill, John was about to reach his most infamous era. On August 6, 1871, John and a few of his cowherding friends decided to stay the night at the American House Hotel. John rented a room by himself, and one night John heard a stranger, Charles Cougar, snoring in the next room over. The thin walls of the hotel couldn't block the noise, and this man's snoring kept John up all night. <laughs> so instead of knocking, you know, knock, hey, can you keep it down? <laughs> John picked up his loaded revolver from the nightstand, <laughs> aimed it at the wall, and fired a few rounds in the room next door. And just like, I'm, I'm sorry I'm laughing. It's just like so insane to think like, I'm just like picturing this scene going down in my head right now. And it's just absolutely ridiculous. It's like, like what? I've been there where my brother, whenever we go, we go on family vacation, like I know it when you, when you're tired after a long day and right. someone's snoring so loud and you can't sleep, I get it that it can be kind of right. it breaks your mind yeah. a little bit and you get pissed, but. Yeah, his first reactions just yeah grab the gun yeah he's like grab the loaded gun point it at the wall shoot <laughs> through the room shoot a few rounds into the room next door obviously you don't know if, I, I think probably john was like if i shoot a few rounds into his room it's gonna <laughs> shut up <laughs> right i don't know i feel like it might have the opposite effect i feel like if somebody if you're sleeping sound and all of a sudden gunshots are gone. You're going to start screaming. You know, you're going to be like scared. It's going to make more noise. But according to John, he's like, oh, I'll just scare the man and make him quiet. But for all we know, maybe he was just like, fuck it. I'm going to kill this guy for a yeah, snoring. I guess. The first bullet struck the ceiling, but then the second bullet made the snoring stop for good. The bullet had traveled through the wall and straight into the snoring man's head. Like always, John tried to defend his actions, which I'm like, hmm. What's your excuse how, this time, John? Can, yeah, come on. So later in his autobiography, John says that a thief had snuck into his room and attacked him, which makes absolutely <laughs> no sense. It's like, what? So if a thief came into your room, why are you shooting through the wall? So maybe he's thinking like, oh, you know, I got up and oh, stray bullets just happened to go through the wall and killed the man by accident. It makes no sense. He did not accidentally kill this guy next door to him. Right. And there's absolutely no other accounts of a story mentioning an attacker in the hotel. Nope. Yeah. No witnesses saw any thief. Right. Nothing. right. Yeah. John's just a man. He's unhinged. He's absolutely unhinged. And what happened to turn in the weapons into the sheriff? Well, I guess he's got such a buddy buddy relationship with Wild Bill that Wild yeah. Bill's like, ah, yeah, no yeah. problem, John. We're, we're good. Yeah. We're buddies now. Which, of course, we don't know if that's true. Of course, yeah. that's just coming from John himself because uh, he probably just smuggled the guns back oh, in yeah. the city when he oh, came yeah. back. I'm sure he probably was like, oh, yeah, here's my guns. I got a three more yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, hidden exactly. in my bag here. Yep. So, oh, John, man, what a crazy dude. Yep. So, obviously, at this point, John had to get out of town. And now Wild Bill apparently was on, on the hook because he had let John keep his weapons within city limits. And now John, unhinged John, had fired off several rounds and killed somebody. So John, half-dressed, grabbed what he could, jumped out the second-story window of the hotel. Apparently a few of his friends followed, which I'm like, where were your friends this whole time? Yeah. Staying in rooms in, next to you? like I did read in one account there might have been a friend in the room with him that was like shoot the wall like that was kind of egging oh. him on supposedly <laughs> of I don't course know. and like he would i don't know i think he's just unhinged and yeah wanted a quick solution there which is like what did you think was going to happen you you kill the person next door you got to get out of town that's murder bro yeah. so they hop out the window and 
you know, they're trying to like sneakily get out of town. And so they hide in some nearby haystacks and they watch this wild bill. And a few of the officers rode up to the hotel because obviously those guns are loud, man. And these these walls are thin. So everybody yeah, in the hotel is hearing it. They're calling the sheriff over. Wild Bill's headed over there. John's like, shit, I got to get out of here before Wild Bill knows that I've killed somebody. Because according to John, he actually wrote later on that he believed that Wild Bill would have definitely killed him on the spot had he caught him. By the next day, a local paper reported that a man was murdered in his bed by a desperado known as Arkansas. John ended up hiding in the haystacks until sunrise, which uh, that must have been a rough night for you. <laughs> right? If he wasn't getting sleep already from the snoring, <laughs> yeah, it's he's like not getting in the haystack. Dude, what are you doing, man? By morning, he stole a horse and made his way back to the- <laughs> <laughs> It's just so ridiculous. <laughs> I can't hold myself together. This over literally here. sounds like some Red Dead Redemption <laughs> yeah. shit right now. This Doesn't it? Oh, man. John's story literally sounds like gameplay from Red Dead Redemption. Yeah. Like, this is some video game <laughs> shit that he's doing right now. He stays in the haystacks all night, waits till the morning, which is like, why wait till the morning to steal a horse? Can't, aren't the horses accessible yeah. all night? Like, why would you stay there all would night? It be easier in the, under the darkness? Right, right to sneak out of town? Yeah, I don't even get it. I mean, I'm assuming that Wild Bill's like out all night looking for whoever did this, or sure. or I'm sure he realized that it was John pretty right. quickly because John's not there, right? And he can't find him in town, so he's like, "Oh God, it's got to be him." My yeah, buddy the, John, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> come on, man, has now murdered somebody in my town, and I basically enabled him to do it. Yep. So he gets a horse, heads out to a cow camp about 35 miles outside of town. And that's when he claimed he was ambushed by three lawmen just outside of the camp. He didn't kill them, but forced them to take off all their clothes and walk back to town naked. For whatever reason, maybe he <laughs> needed some clothes. Maybe he hopped out the window and, and John was naked. <laughs> just this whole whole story is absolutely Makes insane. No sense. So after a day of packing, John left Abilene and never returned. So he decided, you know, it's time to head home to Texas. After getting back to the Lone Star State in October 1871, he managed to kill another lawman, Green Paramore, and also shot a Mexican traveler in cold blood. But John claimed, of course, you know, I have it. This was justified. He said they were following him suspiciously. Probably lawmen trying to track him down, or bounty hunters. I mean, who knows? Right. And like, it's funny. He goes from self-defense to now he's just saying I was being followed. Which you could say about anybody. It's just <laughs> like say that. It's so ridiculous. It's, seen, it's very clear that over the period of his life, John's just like really starting not to give a fuck. He's like, you know what? <laughs> fuck it. I'm a wanted man. I'm just gonna stop caring at all about what I'm doing or how I go about. It. I'm not even trying to be like neat about the way that right. I kill people or, or give valid excuses. It's just like, yeah, the dude was walking behind me. Yeah, <laughs> didn't like it. Yeah, he is in his don't give a fuck. Yeah, he's just here. like, it's time just to go out with a bang, really. Yeah, <laughs> literally. Honestly. So by 1872, though, John tried to settle down after a long string of murders. He actually married a woman named Jane Bowen, and they eventually had three children together. But obviously, once an outlaw, always an outlaw. So while he tried to settle down in Gonzales County, he actually reunited himself with his old outlaw cousins, the Clements and they had allied themselves with a local family known as the Taylors. So the Taylors were, it was this big family that had this rivalry with this other family known as the Suttons. Are you sure it's not the Duttons? <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. This, this, this part reminds me of like Yellowstone the way, you know, rival families. And the, yeah, yeah. You know, and this was supposedly a huge, I, I didn't realize the, how big families were because, you know, you just have, your whole lineage was right. connected and you yeah. were like all your cousins, everything was so cl close knit because there was usually a family business or something like that. Right. So it was really tight. But this feud ended up being one of the deadliest and it started because the Taylors were known for killing black reconstruction era soldiers enlisted by the union that they, they just started targeting a black man. One was just going to a local dance. Another was shot in a saloon. And these were all, this was by the Taylor family members. They would just kill these people seemingly out of nowhere. So obviously it's no surprise John wanted to ally with the Taylor family because they were, you know, killing people of color. So as for the Sutton family, they were connected to the authorities in town 
So really, they were after, since all these people were getting gunned down, the Suttons were, a, a bunch of lawmen were a part of it. So the official feud started in 1868 when William Sutton, who was a deputy sheriff in Clinton, Texas, shot and killed Charlie Taylor while arresting uh. him for horse theft. So really, after that... It was on. Yeah, it was, it like was on. family war. Exactly. Later that same year, William killed another member of the Sutton family named Buck and his associate during a saloon fight. Back and forth, the family members murdered and lynched one another, and this would become one of the bloodiest and long-running family wow. feuds in Old West history. So over a span of 10 years, 35 people wow, between that's the crazy. families ended up dying. Yeah. God, imagine if that happened today, like families feuded like that. Yeah, yeah. That's Isn't insane. that crazy? Yeah. And it's like, it's no shock to me that John caught wind of this he's like oh there's a bunch of people dying yeah right he's like i want in on this yeah Yeah. i mean yeah it's very obvious why john would want to get himself wrapped up in this whole thing so he decided to team up with his cousins and they started doing a lot of the taylor family's dirty work for them in june 1872 he killed a few men trying to arrest him for possessing a firearm and later during a gambling dispute that turned into a shootout On August 7th, 1872, in Trinity, Texas, John was finally wounded by a shotgun blast. John had lost money in a poker game before he escalated things, and he ended up with two buckshot pellets lodged in his kidney. For a while, it looked like this was going to be the end for John Harden. His wound became infected, but somehow he miraculously recovered. While on a sick bed, he surrendered to law enforcement, and he decided he finally wanted a clean slate. So he handed over all of his guns, and asked them to put him on trial for his past crimes. But once he figured out that the local judge was going to charge him with a handful of murders, he realized that he would spend the rest of his life in jail. So he quickly changed his mind about the whole thing. Law enforcement ended up throwing him in a jail cell, but a cousin of his smuggled a saw into a cell. So after he made a full recovery, John was able to cut through the bars of his cell window and hop on out. And over the next few years, he rode with the Taylor family and killed an unknown amount of men during this time. He eventually fled the state of Texas and settled down with his family in Florida, where he took up the last name, Swain. While there, John couldn't let go of his violent nature. In Gainesville, he made an appearance outside of the Alachua County Jail, where an angry mob had formed on May 1st, 1874. A black prisoner named Eli had been accused of attempted assault on a white woman and was jailed inside the building. Outside, the angry mob threatened to burn down the entire building. Things began to escalate, and the mob clashed with the black community that had joined outside of the jailhouse. John eventually knocked down a black man and shot another during the disturbance outside. Then the mob set fire to the jailhouse. As the fire engulfed the building, Eli burned alive while trapped in his cell. And John proudly admitted in his autobiography that he was a part of this mob. He then headed back to Texas to celebrate his 21st birthday. What a life. He has done so much. Oh my God. Yeah. It's just crazy because it's like this is more than what most modern serial killers can do in you know, 10, 20 years. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. I mean, obviously totally different time periods and there's a lot of reasons for why it was much easier back then. But it's just, I mean, in a matter of three years, the amount of killing that he did and just sheer events that have escaped from prison yeah, and the fact that he just a few months earlier he was turning himself in, he was on his deathbed. He's like, I need to, right. I need to come back from this. And it's like, what? How did he get the buckshot out of his kidney? Yeah, who? How did that just like magically heal for him? He's probably a, he has a miraculous surgeon or something. Yeah, but I don't know. I just love that. I I love imagining that he was ready to be turned in. He's like, okay, I'm gonna turn myself in and I'm finally going to come to terms with all this. And then the judge was like, well, we got this murder, this murder, this murder, this murder. He's like, Nope, like, oh, I got to get out of here. Never mind. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Which is like, how did you not know that that was eventually going to catch up with him? Like they're eventually going to figure out you're this wanted guy in Texas who's murdered all these people. I mean, different justice system back then. So yeah, for sure. You know, so on May 26, 1874, John met up with his old gang in a Comanche saloon. And while he celebrated, he spotted Brown County Deputy Sheriff Charles Webb outside. John approached him and asked if he had come to arrest him. Webb said no, so John invited him inside and offered him to buy him a drink. (laughs) Oh, you're not here to arrest me? All right, come on in, I'll buy you a drink. Which is like, wouldn't the sheriff be like, 
why would I want to arrest you? <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, no reason whatsoever. Come on, let's go. Let's go take a shot of whiskey together. All right. But according to John, as they were going inside the saloon, Deputy Webb drew his gun on him right as he turned around. Other accounts say that Webb was only pulling out an arrest warrant as he followed him in. So maybe he was kind of like, you know, trying to find the right moment to put John into custody. But either way, John's crew drew their weapons and gun smoke filled the saloon. Multiple gunshots rang out as Webb was killed instantly. And it didn't take long before the locals heard about the death of their deputy sheriff. So they formed a lynch mob and searched for the men responsible. John's parents, wife, and children were taken into protective custody. John's brother Joe and two of his cousins were arrested on outstanding warrants. In July, the lynch mob eventually broke into the jailhouse where the men were held and they hanged each of them. Their bodies were discovered after the lynch mob left and it looked like they had cut the ropes for the nooses too long. So instead of the men breaking their necks when they hanged them, they slowly suffocated to death. Tufts of grass were found between their toes, which made investigators believe that they were intentionally hanged improperly to cause more pain. After hearing about his brother's lynching, John dealt with attempts on his own life. On two separate occasions, John was attacked by lynch mobs, but he fought them off, killing two more men in the process. He then went into hiding again where he avoided law enforcement and he was even more afraid of the angry local mobs who had no longer put up with his endless violence. By January 1875, the Texas legislature finally authorized the governor to offer a $5,000 reward for the capture of John Wesley Harden, which in today's money was a very sizable amount. By now, John had killed dozens of men in the past few years. So that summer, an undercover ranger named Jack Duncan intercepted a letter sent to John's father. It was from John's brother-in-law, and in the letter he mentioned John's location. He was going by the assumed name of James W. Swain, and he was hiding somewhere on the Alabama-Florida border. Before authorities could reach him, though, two former slaves of John's father heard about the bounty for John's capture. Their names were Jake Menzel and Robert Borup, and they actually found him in Gainesville, Florida, but John had prepared himself. He had spent the last few weeks paranoid about bounty hunters finding him. So, John fashion, there was a shootout, and John killed one of the former slaves and ended up blinding the other. Just when he thought no one could stop him, John's killing spree would finally come to an end. Texas Rangers and local authorities finally caught up with him on a train to Pensacola, Florida. While John noticed the authorities approaching him, he stood up from his seat and tried to draw his weapons by reaching into his vest using a signature cross-draw move. Funny enough, his weapons got caught on his suspenders. So just that little bit of delay in pulling out his guns, one of the officers then charged at John and knocked him unconscious. But he wasn't alone. One of his posse members stood up from their train seat and drew their weapon, but a Texas Ranger was able to shoot and kill them before any more harm was done. Once they got John into custody, they only charged him with the murder of Deputy Charles Webb. He ended up being found guilty and he was sentenced to 25 years in a Huntsville prison. He was also charged with another murder and sentenced to two years, which two years for murder back then. That's that's insane. Yeah. Which maybe he was like, you know, we already got him for 25 years. So, you know, what's one other murder? We'll just add two years to his sentence. But as part of a plea deal, he was allowed to serve the sentences concurrently. At first, John couldn't stand life in prison. He got into fights with other inmates and tried to escape several times, but always failed. But he eventually got used to life in prison. Over time, he read books on religion and became the superintendent of the prison Sunday school. Just like, what? Right. Uh, isn't it funny? Because it's almost like his dad's dream was for him to become yeah, a preacher. That's, and that's really wild to think about. Prison. Yeah, His dad's like, good job, son. Yeah, finally, finally found your way back. Back. <laughs> yeah. back to the right path. <laughs> and apparently, not only did he teach Sunday school, but he also studied the law in his free time. And after the years passed, he constantly suffered from poor health. You remember that shotgun wound to his kidney that he had gotten years before became reinfected in 1883 when he was 30 years old, which this ended up causing him to be bedridden for two years, but apparently he eventually recovered. Almost 10 years passed when on November 6, 1892, John got news that his wife Jane had died. Her cause of death is unknown, but after serving 17 years in prison, John Harden was released on February 17, 1894 and he returned to Gonzales, Texas to be with his children. Later that year, he was actually pardoned by the governor on March 16th. 
And a few months later, on July 21st, he passed the Texas State Bar Exam and got his license to practice law. How ironic is that? Right. And he ended up representing a few family members in court. And on January 9th, 1895, when he was 41 years old, he married a 15-year-old girl named Callie Lewis. That is just absolutely wild. The marriage ended soon after, but it was never legally dissolved. But according to a newspaper article in 1900, John was already back to killing. But this time, it was deemed negligent homicide. He had made a $5 bet that he could take one shot and knock a Mexican man off of a soapbox that he was standing on. And sure enough, he won that bet. But the man fell from the soapbox and died from his injuries. John ended up fleeing to Mexico for a while until the law gave up looking for him, and he eventually returned to Texas. While living in El Paso, John started a relationship with a local woman named Helen Morose, who ran a local boarding house. Helen always noted how fast John could draw his pistols and spin them around. And the more he came around, the more she grew attracted to him. The problem was, Helen was married. She told John about how her husband Martin had crossed the border to Mexico a while back to escape the law, and she hadn't seen him since. But between the two of them, they had a ton of money. Helen began spending the money on dates with her and John. Her husband would actually write her angry letters about her spending, but she knew he had no power over her while he was across the border. John soon got an idea, and he thought if he could get rid of her husband, he could marry Helen and get her money too. He knew her husband was a criminal, so he went to the authorities and told them of Martin's location. So in June of 1895, authorities convinced Martin to come back to the States, and they met along a railroad bridge across the Rio Grande. And this is where they ambushed Martin. When he pulled out a gun to defend himself, they shot him in the heart. So with Martin out of the way, John could finally marry Miss Morose. With her money and the money John had gotten from selling his cattle ranch, they were set for life. And things seemed to be looking great for John. But this wouldn't last very long. John would often gamble the money away and drink heavily. When he came home at night, he would yell at Helen and sometimes threaten to kill her. The drinking and the gambling got so bad that one night John lost $90 while shooting craps, which is over $3,000 in today's money. So he drew his gun and aimed it at the man running the craps table, Phil Baker. He threatened that if he didn't return his money to him, he would die. John was a dangerous man when he was sober, but the locals knew he was even more dangerous when he was drunk. So Phil handed over the money to John, and as John left, he taunted everyone to come and stop him, but no one did. Local authorities began to see how John was just an absolute nuisance in town, and everything came to a head when they arrested Helen Morose. She was arrested by a lawman named John Selman Jr. for brandishing a gun in public. John confronted the lawman and argued with him over the arrest. Later, John's father, Constable John Selman Sr., reproached John Harden on August 19, 1895. John Selman Sr. was 56 years old and a well-known gunslinger at the time, and just like John Harden, he also had a history of violence. The two of them exchanged heated words, and later that night, Selman Sr. found John Harden in the local Acme Saloon, shortly before midnight. John was playing dice inside when Selman Sr. walked up to John from behind, aimed his gun, and blew off his head. John slumped to the floor in front of everyone, and Selman Sr. fired three more shots into his dead body. John ended up dying a brutal and violent death, just like most of his victims. Selman Sr. later faced trial for murder, but claimed self-defense, just like John did for most of his killings. Selman claimed he saw John in a mirror reaching for his gun, so he shot him. But the three autopsies showed that John was shot in the back of the head. Still, the trial ended in a hung jury, and Selman Sr. was released on bond, pending a retrial. But before he could be retried, on April 6, 1896, he got into an argument with the U.S. Marshal George Scarborough, which ended in a shootout, and Selman Sr. ended up dying. John Wesley Harden's remains are currently buried in Concordia Cemetery, El Paso, Texas. In 1995, his great-grandchildren and locals from El Paso got into a confrontation with each other at the cemetery grounds. His great-grandchildren wanted the remains moved to Nixon, Texas. The locals wanted the body to stay where it was. The great-grandchildren had a permit to move the body, but the locals had a court order prohibiting the removal of the body. So they went to court. Both sides accused the other of only wanting the body for tourist revenue. After the lawsuit, the court ruled in favor of the locals from El Paso and his body still remains there to this day. 
Much of John Wesley Hardin's history still remains an enigma. His tale rides the line between fact and fiction, and many believe he killed up to 44 people. But more concrete evidence suggests that he killed around 25. But either way, his life as an outlaw kept his name in the history of the old American West. He'll always be remembered for his hatred towards the Union and the bloodshed caused during his terror through Texas and Kansas. In the end, his final moments were a small taste of his own violence. He was brutally gunned down just like he had gunned down so many of his victims throughout the years. So there you have it. The infamous outlaw, John Wesley Hardin. What a story. I wonder, I wonder what the real body count is yeah is it 25 or 44 i mean depending you know how much of the story is true and how much is is fiction you know but again it'd be hard to like come up with all that concrete evidence especially for those that he just kind of killed in random places along the way the trail. And, yeah and i mean you know maybe he did maybe he actually did and there just was you know there's no evidence of it but he actually did. I mean, it seems like he's just absolutely unhinged, dude. Yeah. That had crazy. a thirst for blood and violence. And and then in the end, what, 17 years in prison, he gets out, and then the governor pardons him. Yeah. Like, what? Which is wild. It, that makes no sense. Yeah, I wonder how all that went down. And it's, it's clear that they didn't know about so much yeah more of his of his crimes because he didn't he didn't write the book until towards the end of his life so yeah if he would have admitted all that before they probably wouldn't have pardoned him or let him out early you know because he only confessed right towards the end which i can only imagine like how hard it was for law enforcement back then to try to like connect these crimes to people like it's not like they had like how they even do it yeah like, no forensics yeah it's like, like they got well this person saw you shot this person so <laughs> yeah that's it yeah that's all the evidence we need i mean i'm surprised i'm surprised he got life in prison for killing the the deputy like i'm surprised they didn't just hang him I or know, kill right? him by firing squad what what did he have like what did he i don't know was he up in like a did he know the politicians i, the I feel like there must have been something, something. Yeah. like he was connected in a way that spared him his life but I, i'm just surprised they didn't hang him like they did everybody else right that's, that's really surprising to me that he got to i mean he definitely lived the average age for for yeah. a male back oh, then. Right i there. mean he yeah. got his full full life per se but you know it's like karma catches up to you in the end you know you're out there it, it's it's fitting that he went out the way that he did yeah, considering but- how many people is very much a live by the sword die by the sword absolutely tale. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely but yeah i just thought this was a, a really interesting and, and wild tale of a wild west outlaw and there's plenty more of where this came from so let us know if this is a you know of interest to you and you enjoyed this one i know we did i mean this the wild west is just such a crazy time there's yeah. so many i mean i'd love to get into like ghost stories from the wild west there's plenty of those and yeah, that'd be fun. um and some of these towns so just some of the things that happened and I mean, you can imagine all the death that happened in these saloons and places like that. And some of these places even still stand today. So, yeah. Yeah. and there's plenty of paranormal activity as a result of just the violence and, and hatred that, <laughs> that went around back then. But I'm going to go ahead and wrap up today's episode there. Let us know your thoughts. If you're watching on YouTube, if you're on Spotify, make sure you're following us there. We really appreciate it. And we will see you next week with another episode. Until then, lights out, everybody.